In this video, we will review the process of DNA profiling and we will see how this process can be used in lab to test a family for the presence of sickle cell anemia. Let's start by reviewing the purpose of DNA profiling. One of the main reasons for this technique is criminal investigation. You can compare the DNA of suspects to the DNA of victims and uh, other potential culprits. You can also use DNA profiling for paternity cases. And the final common method is for screening of genetic diseases. And that's the one we're going to be testing for in lab this week. The first step in any DNA profiling investigation is to isolate DNA from a tissue sample. And there are many different parts of the body where we could find DNA. Teeth, blood, saliva, bones, hair, even semen. Once you've got your DNA sample, the DNA sample is then cut into fragments using special enzymes called restriction enzymes. And restriction enzymes are very specific. There are hundreds of different restriction enzymes out there. <coughs> Excuse me. And each restriction enzyme will cut at a particular restriction site or sequence of DNA. This particular restriction enzyme likes the sequence GCGC, -G -C, and whenever it sees that sequence, it will cut the DNA. And this is crucial because different people have different DNA sequences, and thus, they have a different number of restriction sites. And thus, the same restriction enzyme will cut different people's DNA into different sizes. As you can see, person one has three restriction sites. So their DNA is gonna be cut into one, two, three, four fragments. Person two only has two restriction sites. So their DNA will be cut into one, two, three fragments. So how can we tell the difference in fragment size? DNA sequences are super, super tiny. Well, we're gonna use uh, something called PCR, first of all, to make lots of copies of all those fragments. PCR is short for polymerase chain reaction. And so this process involves a machine and the use of the enzyme DNA polymerase to make tons of copies of all those little DNA fragments. So once we have a lot of DNA fragments, we can then compare their size using equipment called gel electrophoresis. And this equipment will compare the sizes of the DNA fragments. Keep in mind that this equipment can also be used to compare proteins. So let's take a closer look at how gel electrophoresis works. Here's our gel. At one end of the gel are wells, and wells are where the DNA fragments are placed or loaded. The gel is connected to a power source, and the power source will run electricity through the gel. Now, because DNA is always negatively charged, uh, once electricity runs through the gel, the negative electrical current is going to push the negative DNA to the positive pole. And the key here is that longer fragments are going to move, are going to be pushed more slowly. So the closer to the well, the longer the fragment. The further from the well, the shorter the fragment. And then the fragments themselves can be visualized in bands. A band is just a bunch of DNA fragments of the same length. And sometimes the bands will look bigger or darker than other bands. What that means is if the band is really dark or really thick, there were a lot of copies of that particular fragment. So if we were to zoom in microscopically at the gel, this is what we would see. The gel is made of these tiny little particles <clears throat> and there are pores or spaces between the particles. And this is why smaller fragments move farther. It's kind of like an obstacle course and the smaller fragments can move through the course more quickly than those larger fragments which get stuck behind. So even though on the gel the bands may look identical, the key is how far did the band go? So how do we explain what we see on a gel? Well, let's say that we are analyzing two different suspects' DNA. Here is uh, suspect one's DNA, and we cut it with the restriction enzyme. But this suspect has no restriction sites for that enzyme. So they're gonna have one big DNA fragment that's 13 base pairs long. 
Here is suspect two's DNA. <clears throat> suspect two has one restriction site. And so the restriction enzyme is gonna cut the DNA into two fragments. So when we load those fragments into the gel, well one, well two, here is the results that we would get. One band that didn't move very far because this was one big fragment, two bands that moved further because they were smaller. A four base pair fragment, that would be this one, and a nine base pair fragment, that's this band. So in general, there's a pattern here. If you see one band on a gel, that means there were zero restriction sites. If you see two bands on a gel, that means there was one restriction site. One cut gives you two pieces. And if you see three bands, there were two restriction sites. Two cuts, three pieces. And the pattern would continue. So how can we use this technique to test for sickle cell anemia? Well, let's review how sickle cell anemia works. So your red blood cells contain the protein hemoglobin, and hemoglobin carries oxygen. People who have sickle cell anemia have a point mutation in the gene that encodes hemoglobin. It's a single base change. And this is a recessive disease. So you need two copies of that single base change to have full-blown sickle cell anemia. And what that base change does is it encodes a defective hemoglobin protein. The change in base sequence changes the amino acid sequence, which changes the shape into a sickle cell, which changes the function, because now these sickle cells will be stuck in vessels and not able to transport oxygen efficiently. So since this disease is caused by changes in gene sequences, we can use gel electrophoresis to screen for it. So here's the way it works. Here is the DNA sequence for someone with sickle cell anemia. This is the DNA sequence from the sickle cell gene. And then this is the amino acid sequence that is encoded by the DNA sequence. Here is the normal hemoglobin gene. As you can see, here's the point mutation. It should be an A, in sickle cell it's a T. And that means instead of the blue amino acid, we get the val amino acid. So, if we use the restriction enzyme DDE1, which cuts at the restriction site GAG, we're gonna get different results for a person with sickle cell versus normal. A person who is normal has that restriction site, GAG, and so their gene will be cut into two fragments. A person with the sickle cell gene, though, does not have that restriction site, and so the enzyme will not cut their gene into two fragments. It will remain one larger fragment. So then when we load this DNA into a gel, we will see different banding patterns. So in this case, here's a person homozygous for the normal hemoglobin gene, which means the enzyme is going to cut both of their genes into two pieces. And so we see two bands. Here is someone homozygous recessive for sickle cell. They have two copies of this sequence. And because neither copy has a restriction site, they're just going to have one band that didn't move very far because it was a big fragment. Now the heterozygote is very interesting. They have one copy of the normal sequence and that sequence will be cut into two pieces. And so that's why we see these two bands. But they also have a copy of the sickle cell gene which doesn't get cut into fragments, and so we will see this third band that didn't move very far. And so by looking for this pattern, you can determine whether a person has sickle cell, is a carrier, or is normal. And here's a quick overview of the procedure. In class, you'll have a more detailed land handout. Uh, this step will be done for you. You'll receive the gels in class. Uh, you'll remove the combs and put them into the gel chamber. You will load the different DNA samples into the wells. You will attach the cover and hook it up to the power source, making sure to keep black to black and red to red, negative to negative, positive to positive. You'll run electricity through it for about 20 minutes. And then you'll remove the gel and put it in a stain so that we can visualize the bands.
And then we'll leave it overnight and the next day we will analyze the banding patterns and find out who has the disease and who does not. And that concludes our review of DNA profiling and what you are going to be doing in lab tomorrow.